If anyone has ever read any of Shakespeare's material, maybe you read uh, Macbeth, and maybe you read about the witches as they're stirring their cauldron, and then in the midst of a number of statements that the witches make to themselves, they say, by the pricking of my thumb, something wicked this way comes. What does the Bible say about the occult and what is called the paranormal? Well, under those terms, it doesn't have anything said about it. <laughs> but what they mean, it does. In our day and age, and has been for some time, in fact, I don't know ever a time that man hasn't been oh, I don't know, overly interested, at least some, and fascinated at things that go bump in the night. Sometimes we forget that Frankenstein was written way back in the beginning of the 19th century, not in our time. And Dracula was written in the latter part, I believe, of the 19th century, early 20th century. can't remember now. So people have always wondered about that and the mysterious. And some people just get all wrapped up in it. It's one thing to consider all of that as entertainment and fictitious. There's not any truth to it at all any more than Santa Claus. And that's where Santa Claus and Dracula are exactly alike. <laughs> They're fictitious. Thing, a thing is true when it comes to uh, fairies, when it comes to elves, and so forth. Now, John, I'm not talking about fairies the way you have to deal with some who are called that. I saw you. As anyone knows, especially John, in this pulpit, as you look out over there, you can see every move. <laughs> so we're talking about mythical beings. <laughs> we're talking about mythical beings. There's a whole host of movies and TV shows that are geared around the paranormal, and sometimes you hear of paranormal psychology. Well, there's a lot of those theories of psychology that are worse than fictitious stuff. Many knowingly, and I guess some unknowingly, are involved in the occult. Now, what's the definition of paranormal? A claimed occurrence of an event or perception without a scientific explanation as I said John get up somebody's in the house did you hear that <laughs> that's what Sonia says <laughs> and there's nothing there oh but there might have been <laughs> they tell me that somebody was killed in this house years ago and they're still in this house Jody's grandmother lived in a house that house is still there. I think it was built in the 1890s, I believe. And uh, it's been renovated somewhat a couple of times since I first met her. But when I would go over there to see her, I would stay upstairs in that house. Her grandmother would be downstairs in her bedroom, and I had one of the upstairs houses. Now, what is a common occurrence in old houses? They pop, and, and that north wind would whistle down across there, and it would sing. I didn't believe any of these things, but I guarantee you it'd make you sort of wait for a minute. And I think our, our kids probably believe that there are spooks up there. And some of the family thought Grandpa still lurked in that house since he died in the bed down below. 
Well, that goes on to the point to where people are light and have fun with it and all this kind of stuff until there are people who are really serious. This becomes their religion. Now, this is where I'm headed with this. Concerning the occult, that pertains to magic, astrology, to hide from sight or to conceal. Occultism is a belief in or study of supernatural powers and the possibility of human control. Or A necromancer is one who can communicate with the dead. There's the Winchester House. Where is it out there? Yes, yeah, South, where they do all of the multimillionaire, whatever they are. And the Winchester house was built by Ms. Winchester, and she believed in all of this stuff. There's a movie about it. I've been in it. Keith took me out there through it. It was quite a sight to behold. And there's one word to describe a woman or a man or anybody else that would. I'll add a few more words to it. The main word that would build a house like that, uh, accommodating the spooks and all the people that the Winchester rifle has killed over the years. Uh, crazy. <laughs> Only they crazy for <laughs> add a few ints to that craziness. But it's quite a sight to see. So people can get very serious about these things, so much so somebody like her. And that, of course, was all accomplished in her mind before the turn of the 19th to the 20th centuries. I suggest that as we try to reach people, we may be surprised how we may come across folks who believe in this stuff. In fact, have you noticed just driving down the roads how many have the hand out in front of their house, their palm readers, their tarot card readers, and all that stuff? Why? People believe it. They believe it. So we're talking about sorcerers. We're talking about wizards, people who can conjure up ghosts, soothsayers who are observers of times and fortune tellers and charmers of some kind or the other who can use magic spells. You know, if I go boogity, 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 then something may have happened to you. It's strange how people can get themselves in a shape like that, but they're there. You know, they have souls that Christ died for, just like all the rest of us. And so in going out to preach the gospel and who you associate with, you may come across somebody like this. Uh, an enchanter whispers magic spells, interpreting various omens. You see something. What does that mean? What does that mean? There's divination, which gets you all into witchcraft. There's the consultor of familiar spirits. I don't know what all they're called. These are some I have here. But none of them are depending upon the thoughts of God written in black and white in the Bible to determine right and wrong. And we're doing that. So we're interested in maybe what makes your hair crawl up your neck. I remember, for those of us who grew up in the woods hunting like I did and my folks did, at least my daddy did. And at a very young age, some of my earliest recollections, well, he, we would take off to the woods, not even necessarily hunting, but just going. And there was a place called up the road that took its name after an old restaurant, and after the restaurant was long gone, they still called it the Topper. So anybody around that part of the world uh, who went to the Topper, you know what he's talking about. Well, there was a sawmill up there. And they had, they dried their... Um, their timber that they cut up into boards and uh, air dried, so they were stacked a big area. And in going to the woods up there at the topper, <laughs> we'd cross through there and go down behind it, and there's some hills and hollers. And I never will forget when I was, I couldn't have been over four. I just, it just doesn't fit out in my mind knowing the situation surrounding it. We were coming back, and it was kind of the cool of the fall when days are just starting to get cool. And when the sun starts to go down, you can feel that change of things. And we're going up these little small hills and gullies and so forth. 
And we went over one and started down another. And you could just feel the change in the temperature. Well, Daddy always used to love to scare me. And he'd say, do you feel that? Do you feel that? He said, those are haints. Haints are ghosts. And they're moving. <laughs> we got to move on home. <laughs> the thing about it is, I grew up from my background with my grandparents and listen to tell these tales. Especially my daddy's mother and daddy. And my mother, I never knew my grandfather on my father's side. He died before I was born. But my grandmother would tell about, because they're more like, they're more hill people. Mother's daddy all down in the flat part. But they would tell these stories about where they came from in a place called Happy Holler. And they would tell about how that's, they were all sitting on the porch. And those houses in those days they had lanes, sometimes a mile long, half a mile long, you know, coming up to the house. And they all, people sat on the porch in those days. And that's where I heard some of these things. And it made the hair crawl up my back. And I'd scoot away from the knot hole in the porch because I was spooked. I was probably, again, about that age, a little older. And they would tell about how Uncle somebody or Cousin somebody, I forget which, was coming up that lane on a horse, and behind him was this big white floating thing. And they all said it happened. Well, when you get back into the folklore and stuff, you may not have them all called by the names I have given you here, but there were folks that believed all of that. Now, that's all right, if you leave it at just being startled. You know, you can make me jump even when I know that what's making me jump have thing world with a ghost. I think I know what the poison snakes are, but sometimes I've walked up on a snake and I didn't identify him until I was already coming back down from the jump in the air. <laughs> so that can happen. But here's what the Bible has to say about the occult, and we'll start in the Old Testament, Exodus 22, 18. Now, you've got to remember the people that lived at that time and the paganism cultivated all this stuff because they believed in all this. It was real to them, very real to them. And so among the Jews, this commandment, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Now, of course, when you get into the witch trials of the 1600s up in New England and all that, they made no distinction between the law of Moses and the New Testament of Christ. So they still looked at this stuff as if there were still witches on the earth. Well, there never has been a real witch like you read of in the things that go bump in the night. These were always charlatans who played on the emotions of people Leviticus 19.31 reads, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. In Leviticus 20 and verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards to go whoring after them, that's the way God described it, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. And you can go on through several passages in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy and 1 Chronicles, and see this kind of teaching done for the children of Israel and how they were to live under the law of Moses and what it told them to stay away from. There was no good coming from these people. There was nothing that the law of Moses could not supply for the people as to their needs spiritually. Well, what about astrology and astrological forecasts and horoscopes? Well, you think people just don't know anything. They're not educated or whatever else. They go more by emotions. Well, what we fail to realize, people can be highly educated in a number of disciplines and still be more emotional than they are anything else. Still how they're things that go bump in the night. When I was working on my master's program, there was a lady in there at that time who was as old as my parents back then. And very nice lady, very dignified looking in her dress, very pleasant to be around. 
And I forgot, I think we were working on terminal matters as far as the papers we had to turn in toward the end. And so we were sitting there and just started waiting on professors to come or something. And we were visiting. And she was working on something very diligently. And I could see it was sort of a chart-like thing, but I wasn't trying to see exactly what was going on. But she spoke up and told me, and we were the only two there. And she was a professional horoscope maker and got paid several hundred dollars for making somebody's horoscope, James. And you think, well, somebody's serious about this and to pay that kind of money for it. And they're looking for guidance and direction. Well, I think that's rather interesting. The astrological forecasts are very popular with millions of people. And most of the mainstream newspapers have for years carried these forecasts. And many people even plan their day around these forecasts. I think you'll remember, and it wasn't just rumor, that Nancy Reagan wouldn't hardly do much of anything until she checked with there was a woman who dealt as her astrologist on what to do and so forth. You'd think, well, why don't people do that kind of thing? Um, that's what I meant last week when I said I'm a conservative. Let me what, tell you what I'm trying to conserve. She was a conservative, supposedly. So you got to know what people believe about things. And so what does the Bible say about it? Well, I want to look at Isaiah, the prophet. I'll read verses 11 through 14 of chapter 47. Therefore shall evil come upon thee. Thou shalt not know from whence it riseth. And mischief shall fall upon thee, thou shalt not be able to put it off. And desolation shall come upon thee suddenly, which thou shalt not know. Stand now with mine enchantment, with thine enchantments, and with the multitudes of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be, thou shalt be able to profit. If so be, thou mayest prevail. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsel. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. Behold, they shall be as stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before. Well, I don't see any reason if such folks declare themselves to be of the same of the same caliber that those words wouldn't apply to those folks today as far as what they can really do in being able to declare the future or what's going to happen in tonight and all of these particular things. There's God's attitude about it for fleshly Israel. People are going to a cult to the occult for their information. They were then on the spiritual matters instead of the word of God. Now, again, I understand the pagan countries surrounding Israel. Israel is quite small compared to them. But they were a constantly a pull on Israel. Had all these multitudes of gods. Israel was the odd man out as far as believing in one God and the law of Moses. And that's the only way you receive direction. And you remember that as far as we're concerned today... When you look at the New Testament in uh, 1 Peter, or I believe it's 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, it just harkens right back to the scriptures. He says, according, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, watch it, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Well, that's just simply saying what 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says in James 1, 25. We have the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final and complete revelation of God to man. What more does any person want? What more does any person need in order to be faithful to God? You can see also that such was dealt with in the New Testament the view that the Holy Spirit takes to the New Testament writers is found really in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. These are listed, as you know them, and I know them mostly, as the works of the flesh. 
Now watch what he says beginning in Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, what's that next word? Witchcraft, hatred, variance, simulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, endings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and then he says, and such like. That would have to do with sorcery. It had to do with all those other things I said. When he says such like, that means in these like are things like these. So you don't have to have it just named explicitly to have something like them. And he says that's all involved in the works of the flesh. And you'll notice that he says in the verse, uh, latter part of verse 21, he said, I've told you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, they're going to be lost. You can't go to heaven. And, of course, the last book of the Bible makes it very plain about such matters. And we often will talk about Revelation 21.8. But that makes it very clear that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But he has more people in that list. He said, but the fearful, unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters then and all liars. So he lumps all these characters into the same much. They're false teachers. Well, they fit so easy and can accomplish so much when you're already pagans because of the way those religions work. And you can see what kind of a hold it had on people when you see Philip going down to Samaria to preach. Well, they've got a fellow there who's a master magician. And he's got everybody bewitched, it says. But I guess he was an honest-hearted person because he knew he was a liar. <laughs> and a lot of them do. But they convince themselves so long in doing it, they've hardened their heart and they believe what they tell is the truth even when they know it's a lie. We don't realize how deceitful things like that can be. And so Philip preaches and people obey the gospel. Simon heard it and he obeyed the gospel too. But he still got a hold over. And he wasn't just interested in the miracles that Philip did. Here comes Peter and John as apostles, and they lay hands on folks, and they receive different miraculous gifts. Well, he wants to get right to the top. He offers them money to have the power not just to work miracles, but to convey to others the power to work miracles, as had happened with Philip. But he heard the will of the Lord on the matter. And Peter told him, your money perish with you. And you told him your heart's not right. Well, it sounds like from the wording that the man took the rebuke pretty straight. And he said, pray God, none of these things you've spoken will happen to me. Wouldn't it be wonderful in preaching the gospel to folks that you had that kind of honesty? That even then as they try to throw off the shackles of a long-term practice thing, they slide back in it. But then when they rebuke, they come out of it. But nevertheless, it points up today that people who do the same thing today aren't any better off. And you can just read through the book of Acts and see how God dealt with things. Now, we dealt with matters earlier about true demon possessions and such like that. They were real. Well, it would be interesting to see things today if some of these who claim to be sorcerers and whatever actually confronted somebody who was possessed of a demon now there was that happened back in the, in the time of, of Luke's record. There was one seven sons of Sceva. And they weren't Christians, but they had seen these demons departing the premises when Paul cast them out by the authority of Christ. So they went in and they were going to cast demons out of this person. And they said, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preacheth, well, the fellow in whom the demons were on jumped on them beat them and they left half naked and wounded it sort of shows you you better really have the authority of the lord behind you when you act or you may be overcome by the very thing that you're trying to oppose so even if you had these things today which we don't and these fellows we're talking about here wizards soothsayers charmers necromancer enchanters witches whatever they don't have anything it's all sleight of hand there is a, what is it, Wicca? Well, the Wiccans, they have that organization of wicked, uh, well, <laughs> probably are wicked, organization of witches. And they're real. I talked to one 
woman one time whose aunt was a member of it. And what do they do? Nothing. Except get your money. There's two things I think would work well to make a lot of money if you didn't care how you made it. Open a liquor store with a soothsayer right beside it. <laughs> get them liquored up as much as you could and you could scare them out of all sorts of things. So we look at it and we realize, does this tell me how far people can sink in their intellectual corruption? Yes. It does. Without their self-control, which the Bible speaks about a lot. Remember in Galatians 5.21, such like. The things that are like what he named. And then remember 1 Thessalonians 5.22. When evil appears, we're to flee from it. As soon as you see it, you don't walk up and do a full tale investigation. When you recognize it, that which is contrary to the will of heaven, you leave it alone. Now remember the age of miracles has passed. So even when there was the possession of people against their will by demons and such like, there were at that time people who could cast them out and they're gone. We must understand that the demon possession of that time was totally different from the spirit divination. You don't have anybody like that nowadays. You have imitators. You have sleight of hand. The preacher where Timothy and his family attend is a professional magician. And he's uh, big buddies with, uh, what's the name of the magician that's world-renowned? Who? I think that's him. And they, they know one another, and when he flies out for reasons out to Las Vegas, think he visited him. I believe that's the right name. But anyway, he's very good. Very good. But he'd be the first one to tell you that it's all trickery and it's all sleight of hand. So there's some things we might enjoy just because we like the thrill of it or we like to scare ourselves. I think I know some that like to go through on Halloween into these haunted houses. They just like to have somebody scare them. If you want to throw a monkey wrench into those folks' plans when they're supposed to be scaring you to death, just stand there and look at them. And just see what kind of antics they go through to try to scare you. That's what I did when I went with them one time. The one time made the person upset. I just didn't look at them. I wasn't scared. What was there to be scared of? I might have scared them, but uh, be that as it may. Well, I've handled this kind of lightly, but I've done it for a reason. That which we see to be what it is, some people take very seriously. And in other countries, even more seriously. I found out in Russia they actually believe in the evil eye. And uh, I think over here people joke about it and say, did he give you the stink eye? Well, I don't know what they had that in mind, but the evil eyes were somebody... And look that eye on you and you're cursed by it. Well, you get to working with a bunch of people like that trying to convert them. And you got other problems that arise more than some of the problems we have. So, what do we do? We prepare ourselves just like for Methodist and Baptist and everybody else that's up for something. And just realize these folks are moved much further away than even them. But they got souls and Jesus died for them. He shed his blood for them. And if we have the opportunity, we ought to try to help them. So what we take lightly, other people take very seriously. And I understand in closing that in Africa among those tribes, those witch doctors still hold tremendous power over the tribes. And so if you're going into those places, just talk to some of the gospel preachers who've gone and seen what they've had to deal with in some of those people. To be a Christian, that's the greatest thing that a person can be on this earth. Whatever else you may do that's in harmony with being a Christian, as the Bible defines it and uses it, there's no greater thing on this earth than to be one who is of Christ. Your old sins are remitted. You're a new creature in Christ. The hope of heaven is before you. 
and the comfort of God given through the Holy Scriptures is there. We have such great and exceeding great precious promises for us. We always talk about the things coming to an end here, and they will for every one of us. There will be a time when not a soul of us will be walking this earth, even as our ancestors, all the people in the past. But for those who love the Lord, obeyed the gospel, added to the church, and was faithful, when we step into eternity, there's nothing but joy and peace and happiness and comfort that our simple little mortal minds can't begin to grasp. What God hath in store for his faithful children is beyond the mind's eye, it's beyond the mind to grasp what all that is. And we should rejoice in the hope and not be tangled up in anything that's false take us, that would take us away from the word of God and thereby God. You need to become a Christian by believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ as the Son of God, and complete your obedience to the gospel by being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, are you walking the straight and narrow way? Are you faithful? Are you loving the Lord and growing in that love every day and in the knowledge of the truth and living closer to Him? If you haven't, been doing that through some sin you've committed. We urge you to repent of it, turn back to God and serve Him faithfully and confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. Time's too brief and we can already remember people that were with us and just like we are and we say, you mean it's, it's already been 10 years since He died? It's already been 5 years since He left us? It's already been 30 years? What well, just seems like yesterday and I can almost look now and see Him coming down the aisle. Better than that's going to be in store for all of us, for those left behind, because we almost leave. But we leave, and we're still the same person that we always were. So let's be sure we leave this world righteous, godly, and well-pleasing in God's sight. So if you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.